Okay. So, hello everyone. Good evening. Welcome to this event organized by the Ocinus Foundation, a geopolitics and security affairs organization. Probably then we'll follow up with Q&A session where audience can put their questions in the chat box. Meanwhile, I request our audience to keep their microphones muted and video switched off. Today we have experts in gender studies and women's rights. The topic of today's discussion is understanding women's lives in conflict zones. As UNFPA noted on its website, the costs of conflict are great. The costs of conflict paid largely by women and girls are incalculable. With this in mind, I welcome my eminent panel members. Let's begin with the introduction. We have Dr. Bahar Jalali, a visiting associate professor at Loyola University, Maryland. She is the founder of the first gender study program in Afghanistan and the director of the country's first women's program. He taught at American University in Kabul in 2009. Her recent campaign calling for protection of women's rights and preservation of cultural heritage in Afghanistan received extensive coverage in international press. Next, we have Dr. Priyanka Chandra, an assist assistant professor at Jindal School of International Affairs. Her specialization includes political Islam, gender studies, especially the women's movement with a focus on West Asia, North Africa, and South Asia. She also looks at the intersection of religion and politics through the ideological evolutions in political Islam and its role in the contemporary world. Then we have Ms. Mina Nizami, a mental health and women's rights advocate from Afghanistan. She is the founder and president of Girl Up, United Nations Foundation, Afghanistan. Let's begin. Um, I, I, Welcome my all panel members. Thank you for joining us today and thank you audience. So let's begin. My first question is to you, Dr. Jalali. Uh, how do you see the status of women in public and private sphere in the post-Soviet era in Afghanistan? And how did it change after the U.S. invasion? So uh, we're going to be beginning with the post-Soviet era. Is that correct? Okay, that's a very good starting point um, because it was the reversal of women's rights in Afghanistan actually began exactly right then. Um, in 1992, uh, when the Afghan communist regime uh, collapsed uh, and the Afghan Mujahideen, basically the Islamist resistance, the Soviet occupation, uh, marched into Kabul and took power. Now, the Mujahideen were a group of different factions. Um, uh, that's really when, you know, we, we, we begin to see a reversal of women's rights. Now, unfortunately, today, many people in, are familiar with Afghanistan uh, as a place where women's rights have always been, uh, uh, you know, restricted. And that's absolutely not true. Uh, prior to the takeover of power by the Mujahideen in 1992, Afghan ex Afghanistan experienced almost a century of gains in women's rights, which all, of course, became restricted when the Mujahideen came to power. Now, in 1992, when the Mujahideen came to power, for the first time in the history of Afghanistan, the name of the country was changed to the Islamic State of Afghanistan. Um, uh, uh, restrictions on women's rights that never existed before, such as um, incarcerating runaway women were introduced. Now, that's something that never existed in Afghanistan before. Of course, the Mujahideen were very disunited, and as the country um, you know, collapse into civil war, gender-based violence became a, an acute problem. Uh, women were raped with impunity, sexual assault increased, 
And basically, there was absolutely no human security. And when I talk about gender-based violence, I'm talking about very, very horrific uh, uh, attacks on women, such as the cutting off of breasts, such as ripping apart uh, a pregnant woman's womb and extracting uh, the baby. So it was this context, of course, this lawlessness that gave rise to the emergence of the Taliban, which, of course, uh, exacerbated that already horrible situation. The Taliban, of course, uh, uh, reversed Afghan women's formal rights. Now, during the Civil War, it was a state of lawlessness, so many girls could not attend school because of insecurity. But the Taliban, which I should mention, is not an Afghan movement. And I, I want the world to know that the Taliban do not represent Afghan culture. Uh, their rank and file are people who were born and bred in Pakistan, trained in Pakistani madrasas. And so the Taliban reversed Afghan women's formal rights, which can be traced to the late 19th century. Now, in 2001, when the U.S. intervenes, of course, it was the dawn of a new era. And the most important thing that happened was the restoration of Afghan women's formal rights. But I should add that the way women were used as strategic pawns in the 20-year war in Afghanistan meant that there were positive outcomes, but also negative outcomes. Um, uh, one negative outcome was that the image of the Afghan woman as this archetypal victim uh, was a distorted image. Uh, Afghanistan has a whole century of prior history of women entering parliament, of Afghan leaders who promoted feminist reforms. Of course, a positive impact was that the, with the help of the international community, women were able to see their right, fundamental rights restored. Those were fundamental gains, but as we have seen since August of 2021, these were very fragile gains, which are now have been reversed by the second iteration of the Taliban regime. So I'm happy to elaborate further uh, during our talk today. Yeah, thank you. Um, and as you said, Taliban do not represent the complete Afghanistan and they are voices that resonate with the views of Taliban. Moving on, my next, next question is for Dr. Priyanka. Uh, what changes do you think women witnessed in their social, political and economic roles after the Arab Spring? Thank you so much uh, for the question and thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so it's interesting again that you've chosen to talk about the post Arab Spring uprisings uh, because uh, uh, I, I just like, you, like to take you for a moment to what was happening during the Arab Spring because it's important to see how those particular set of events have then, you know, uh, shaped uh, subsequent roles for women. It was a very interesting time, of course, as this very spontaneous transnational movement that emerged. And uh, um, of course, in the short term, people were trying to determine the success and failure based on regime change. But uh, in the long term, it has been a very important event because of the kind of ideas, because of the newer kinds of uh, uh, civil society activism that, that you saw in that time. And one of the key factors of that was women's participation. Uh, if you saw the Tahrir Square, if you saw in Tunisia and other parts of uh, West Asia, women were not only participating uh, equally in these very spontaneous protests, but they were bringing to the fore women's issues, right? And from women from across the board, from different factions, uh, those uh, who, who uh, believe in and uh, follow secular politics, although the, also those who were speaking from a religious perspective, uh, were asking for greater political liberties, uh, greater representation the right to contest uh, right up to the highest offices in countries like Egypt. And this became one of the contentious issues subsequently. Um, and and a greater agency as economic and political beings, right? So, the, so having a very, very comprehensive notion of what citizenship is going to be for them and what it, it should entail. Uh, what has happened since uh, is uh, what is what we see is that um, Unfortunately, there are two kinds of challenges on two different levels that women have faced in, in uh, you know, what their role has been so far. And uh, I wouldn't just say that it's a role in kind of reconstructing the politics of these societies, but also renegotiating citizenship. 
right? Uh, so, and and uh, I just like to make a comment about uh, how we are talking about conflicts. Before I do that, uh, I know today we are focusing a lot on armed conflicts and uh, you know uh, 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 where there is violence, but. Uh, Part of what we need to do, I think, is also take a more comprehensive view of conflict and how it emerges and what qualifies as a conflict situation, because then it has a very specific impact on women, right? Uh, so if there's armed conflict or if there is an interstate uh, conflict uh, that is typically recognized internationally as a, a, a conflict. But sometimes what happens when the state itself turns rogue on its own populations or part of it, right? Uh, and and so the, the the status of citizenship itself can become contested when you have certain kinds of regimes in power. Uh, Dr. Jalali has already spoken about, and we'll talk more about uh, Afghanistan. But you also see similar things that happened subsequently across West Asia, where there was, in some cases, a military coup, and you had the reinstating of military regimes. In other places, there were. Uh, only very limited uh, negotiations made to allow for some limited changes. For instance, the Gulf monarchies are an interesting example, where uh, the ruling regimes are willing to give limited, uh, 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 allow for limited changes and, and uh, degrees of emancipation, degrees of political rights. Uh, but of course, with, with a limit and a cap to them. And so that has meant that the uh, ways in which this, this uh, reimagination of citizenship was happening in the Arab Spring, uh, you have not actually seen that fully uh, 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 happen on the ground. And then there is the, the second layer, which is uh, the perceptions of the international community, uh, you know, uh, and I'm not just saying this in terms of how the outsider thinks about regions like West Asia or uh, Arab societies, Iranian society, the Islamic societies, uh, but also how those play into policy decisions, how they play into international relations and the uh, uh, attitudes of people in positions of power and how they become internalized within the region as well. So in that sense, uh, there's been this long ongoing debate and lots of aspersions that have been made about the possibilities of democratization in Islamic countries and the problem of how, you know, this, this is very oriental idea of how Muslim societies are incapable of being democratic. And uh, uh, they are because of the nature of re religion, they are inherently uh, not only conservative, but oppressive to women. And um, so all the international outrage then seems to become channelized in that way. But actually, this is a very Orientalist perception of the problem. And it actually obfuscates. It, it actually, uh, uh, you know, gives us a, only a partial view of what is actually happening. And again, it reduces the actual uh, uh, people in those situations, in conflict situations, or in any kind of uh, political strife to, uh, as Dr. Jalali was saying, to, to the stereotypical victims without any agency. So, uh, you know, that, 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 uh, that's a, that's a, a, a twin layered problem then that women within these regions are, are facing. And, um, I think the reason why these conversations are important is also because we need to be in a, a constant uh, critique of or be constantly rethinking the ways in which we are understanding the locations of women in these particular situations. So um, I'll stop here, but I'll be happy to speak a little more about especially this oriental gaze and how that means that, you know, uh, the voices that are emerging from within these regions continue to be marginalized, even when it is these regions that are being talked about. over to Smriti. Uh, I think uh, her internet connection is not working properly. Ma'am, you can carry uh, what you're talking about. So he'll, she'll join in a minute. Okay. Um, all right. So as I was saying, I mean, there is this uh, uh, double layered problem and also uh, the ways in which we think about conflict. So um, just to add to, uh, uh, you know, uh, how conflicts play out and how violence plays out. Uh, we all know, of course, that 
part of the problem is that women's bodies are subjected in this way where they are reduced to just the sexualization and the uh, targeted sexual violence then they, that they then face these can come from armed groups these can come from uh, non state actors they can also come from state there is also state sponsored violence which happens sometimes and it can be deliberately uh, uh, you know sexual in nature this was also something that was being seen in the arab spring uprisings for instance a lot of the protesters a lot of civil society activists were there was an attempt by authorities of the state in countries like egypt and in, in other countries where the protests were going on uh, to push them out by deliberately targeting their bodies so whether it was you know tearing their clothes in public and humiliating them whether it, whether it was forced virginity tests uh, or these arbitrary and and very gruesome uh, uh, um, acts of violence this was also being done by states a lot of the times so you know the ways in which we think about how women's bodies are being subjected and and by whom uh, is is something that we need to take a very very holistic view of because uh, because they can become this subject from both sides you know uh, and again the fear is that we should not reduce them in the process to this this stereotypical uh, victim or this person who's without agency and needs to be saved because therein comes the problem from from uh, the international community or from international initiatives uh thank you thank you for the response and i'm really sorry for the inconvenience uh this power issue here so so it, uh, during conflict we just understand as you discussed that it becomes uh, all the more difficult for women to renegotiate their citizenship due to unequal power dynamics in the society uh, so my question to ms uh, neema nizami now uh, in your assessment what is the condition of women under taliban rule how would you characterize the international community's response to it Uh, we have already discussed much of this uh, as ms Jal dr jalali and dr priyanka discussed but will you elaborate further to uh thank you so much smriti um uh, for me, uh, hosting this uh, event today and i would like to extend my uh greetings to ms um uh, mrs jalali and um all the other uh Uh, speakers in today's event i'm happy to be here with you all my name is meena and um i'm the founder of girl up afghanistan girl up is a united nations foundation initiative which works all across the world in different countries and we are just a small part of that initiative in afghanistan um uh, we worked for about 1 to 2 years and um the activities unfortunately stopped because of um uh the new regime that came and most of our programs were in schools and universities which targeted the adolescent girls so the information that i am about to share with you all would be um mostly about the situation i'm aware of the girls um you know uh, the teenage girls the adolescent girls who are in schools and universities which are the now they are banned from going um so um uh, uh in regard with your question i think um, the status of women uh, in general for a very very long time in afghanistan it wasn't as good as idealistic as we would see but yes during the previous government there were some some little bit of improvements that were made on their part but now um uh, the education uh, have been um, put on halt for all the girls Uh, in schools and for the universities as well and, and it's a very tricky question actually the education part because i did an interview with amnesty international um about um 2 to 3 months ago and i was waiting for a response from uh, my colleagues in afghanistan regarding the education situation which then i received that in march uh, all the schools for girls um uh, and universities for girls will be open the government and the non government ones um and the only condition would be that the girls and the um, uh, boys would be in separate classrooms but um that only continued for just about um a few days and then again it stopped so i personally do not know the reason for it it could be um uh, religious dogmatization of the um, uh, ideas or anything else but uh, the situation as we all know from the news and um uh, i have uh, um uh, real um 
uh, sources as well telling me that it's not good and not that just the women are in a very bad poor condition well, women who do not have a um, a male in their house to bring um, uh, to have income in any sort all of the situation the economy of afghanistan is collapsing overall because uh, there are multiple reasons political and social reasons for that but uh, definitely women girls and the children are the uh, direct and the most um, uh, badly hit victims in, in this situation so um uh, this is uh, what I'm aware of it and about the international recognition, um, international community's recognition towards the pro this problem and what they're doing about it. So as far as I am connected with um, some of the international organizations and what I can do from my part, I think it's every, each and every in individual's responsibility to take something and do something uh, for the people that they can help. So for my part, for my part, I think um, uh, some organizations from Spain, they really helped um, uh, in collaboration um, uh, with uh, Girl Up, our organization, and others that were in Afghanistan. We did help some of the women who were, whose lives were in danger to get out of the country, who seek refuge. So we are really um, uh, glad um, that uh, they did help uh, these girls or these women who uh, were targeted uh, by um, the terrorist groups to get out of the country, but uh, we all know that this is not the final decision, right? This is not. This cannot be the final solution to the problem. There are there are like millions of women living in Afghanistan, and we have to make a better life for for them in their own country. So we cannot keep running away from our country. How far are we going to run to U.S. to Europe? Wherever we go, women are going to face problems anywhere. So um, we the deep rooted. Um, uh, problem is in Afghanistan, and we have to find ways to solve that within the country, inside the people, within the women, within the women communities inside Afghanistan, and that can be only done through education. And another part uh, um, point that I would like to mention is this. Um, I hope I'm audible, since this event is hosted by um, uh, our Indian uh, fellows, Indian colleagues. Um, it's been uh, for over about more than, I think, uh, since the Taliban came. I know this it would be a foreign policy of the Indian government, where um, most of the Afghan students, um, uh, women and men who are in Afghanistan, they cannot travel to continue their education. So in any sort, um, the visas are banned for Afghans uh, to visit India um, uh, in, for anything I know to Tourism would not be the ideal reason to go because we know there is also COVID issue, but um, those students who have um, to continue their education, their studies. So India was a long lasting friend with, the Af with Afghanistan, with the Afghan government. I know any government might come and go, but this uh, human relationship between the two people should not you know, um, be suffered in between. And as we all know that we both the countries we all have ideals that we respect education, that we want girls and um, the people of both the countries to be educated. This is a very genuine request because there are at, at least that I know of, there are like thousands of students who are waiting to continue their education back in India. Um, so this would be something that I want from Indian colleagues to take into consideration. Um, and um, uh, I hope uh, this uh, is something that we can do from our part. Um, this is something that you can do from your part as an international community. And other than that, I know that European countries, um, they have done something from their part, but uh, let's start from the beginning. Let's start from something small, something as small as getting visas for students to continue their education back in India. Um, to give um, girls scholarships to go abroad and study and then come back and work for their people, for their own girls in their own communities. So these are the small steps that we can take. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, and I completely agree that solution has to be, has to come and has to reside in the local population within, in between them in, in Afghanistan. And I can relate completely to Afghan students. I've been in JNU and I've seen them in thoroughly and closely. So let me go back to Dr. Jalali now in uh, light of what we have discussed till now. Where do you see the future of women in Afghanistan? 
as we know that Taliban has reportedly banned girls' education and curtailed all women's rights. Well, if we uh, look at the current moment, the, the Afghan women don't seem to have a future. Uh, being uh, adolescent girls, it's been almost 300 days that teenage girls have been banned from going to school. Um, women o are only allowed to work uh, in a few uh uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 professions. And ba basically what we have seen is uh, in the history of Afghanistan, you've had various periods where there was social reform and then that was, of course, unraveled, followed by a period, a, a reactionary period. It happened in the 1920s. Uh, you know, in, that, in the 1920s, we had a very feminist king. Uh, of course, his uh, efforts to radically reform Afghanistan failed, although he left a durable legacy. And of course, the regime that followed him had a very had a much slower approach to uh, reform. And then, of course, as you mentioned in the very beginning, uh, you know, during the communist era, there was, of course, uh, emancipating women was a big slogan. Of course, that, that was followed by the Mujahideen regime, which, of course, uh, introduced uh, uh, restrictions that never existed in Afghanistan. And so what we're seeing right now is another period, another reactionary period that has followed uh, uh, two decades uh, of efforts to restore the rights of women. So this is in the history of Afghanistan, the annals of the history of Afghanistan, this is, you know, a recurring pattern. Um, but I think what's different now than in the 1990s is the world has changed. Global discourse has shifted. We see the uh, reversal of human rights, especially as they pertain to women, not only in Afghanistan, but throughout the world. Uh, in Hungary a few years ago, they banned the study of gender studies. In the United States, just, you know, very recently, we saw the uh, uh, overturning of Roe versus Wade. So unfortunately, mm -hmm. I see this as a global trend. And that, of course, impacts how the horrible situation of Afghan women is perceived. Because 20 years ago, when the U.S. invaded Afghanistan, you know, uh, liberating Afghan women was a big, it was a centerpiece, uh, uh, you know, uh, justification for the war, although there's all kinds of uh, problems associated with it. Nevertheless, it was a global concern. Today, it's not. And unfortunately, that is going to, that impacts how uh, people continue, how governments, how diplomats, how the global community engage with the Taliban. The Taliban are being normalized, you know, uh, in yeah. ways that uh, never happened in the 1990s. In the 1990s, they were isolated, they were ostracized, they were a global pariah. But today, you know, you see all of these prominent diplomats, the head of UN human rights, uh, diplomats from uh, the most powerful countries in the world sitting with the Taliban. And although they have not been officially recognized as the uh, government of Afghanistan, they are being treated as such. So under the current circumstances, uh, things could only get worse for women. Uh, you know, uh, and what we have seen is that this normalization of the Taliban has only emboldened them further, has elevated them. Uh, the way that the Trump administration, uh, you know, carried out that notorious so-called peace deal. And then, of course, uh, um, you know, uh, it feels as though the world no longer cares about Afghan women, that it, you know, uh, promoting with Afghan women's rights was a strategic uh, a tool during the war on terror. Now it has no strategic value. So uh, what were Afghan women? They were pawns used in the geopolitical conflict. And now that, you know, that, that's no longer strategically viable, their rights can be, uh, are, are disposable. It's, you know, uh, their rights are a, a casualty of greater geopolitics. So uh, it's, it's extremely alarming. Uh, uh, I don't see a future, but what I do see is history repeating itself. Um, you know, uh, uh, terrorist networks will increase in Afghanistan. Uh, the Taliban are going, you know, uh, Taliban 2.0 is no different from Taliban 1.0. If anything, they are more lethal because they are being elevated by uh, the global powers. And I see the situation for women getting worse. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So as you say, there is no good Taliban or bad Taliban, and we, de have, we have to delegitimize them. Okay. Uh, next, my question to you, Dr. Priyanka. 
uh, what are your thoughts on the imposition of Western notions of feminism in the West Asia and South Asia, given that these regions have a different conception of feminism? I mean, it's difficult not to feel some of the frustration and hopelessness. And so one does ask, what is the conception of feminism, right? Uh, 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 what Dr. Jalali was talking about, we even see that in South Asia. Uh, or we even see that despite a commitment to things like education uh, and, and poverty elevation, uh, there are sometimes state actions which are actually uh, actually uh, pushing young women out of the classroom uh, that has happened in india very recently with the hijab row and it has happened in 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 uh, multiple places so it is very difficult but uh, uh, and and also yes the fact that there is a sort of very quick normalization of both the conflict and impact of conflict internationally uh, you know um, uh, that is something that that is is uh, extremely worrying, and uh, in terms of how the Western perceptions are are uh, uh, impacting all of this on the ground, you see that there is an asymmetry. I mean, asymmetry is a very uh, uh, a uh, mild word perhaps, but there's an asymmetry in the very treatment of or the very perception of conflict. We are all observing what's happening in Ukraine, uh, which is extremely heart-wrenching and extremely disturbing, and it is a conflict. It is an act of aggression. Uh, people call it the Ukrainian crisis as if it was just internally made up and it just imploded, which of course is not the case. Uh, it is important to uh, uh, appreciate the, the very ready responses of the international community, the European countries, uh, Canada, US, other parts of the world, in, for instance, trying to rehabilitate or accommodate uh, Ukrainian refugees. It is very heartening. It is also very disheartening because one is instantly reminded of the Syrian refugee crisis, where the efforts of most European countries, and there were exceptions like Germany and others, but there were efforts uh, by a lot of the countries to actually shut down borders. It seemed like the Syrian refugee crisis was a crisis for European nations uh, in trying to, you know, uh, uh, make themselves secure and not the crisis of people who were actually fleeing conflict situations, right? So, uh, and, and that is a disparity you continue to see. You see it even in media narratives today. Uh, I think one big problem we face is and it's happened because of this shifting international discourse uh, is this amnesia that global memory seems to be suffering from right now. Uh, the fact is that nobody's talking about Afghanistan right now, and it was just happening last year, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at the kind of media reporting of Ukraine, you see horrific, uh, I mean, it goes beyond Oriental, it is outright racist, some of the remarks that journalists, diplomats, politicians have made uh, saying why uh, the crisis in Ukraine is unacceptable because it is not one of those far-flung uh, non-Western places where this thing is, you know, uh, very common and, and to be expected. And which is a horrific statement for anyone in any position of authority to make. So, you know, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's no longer... Uh, camouflaged in any way. It is not subtle. It is actually very blatant, this, these kinds of asymmetries which are there. And uh, so it, it becomes very important to look into with how, how many people, how many initiatives are uh, even working towards, let's say, women in Yemen right now, uh, where there is an acute food shortage and a food crisis, which is a result of a proxy conflict, essentially, right? Uh, what is happening to Iraqi women? Uh, where there is this effort towards rehabilitation and uh, they are still facing the trauma and, and, and the impact of what happened in Iraq. Uh, when you see women who were targeted by ISIS, you know, and, and that is a very unique situation because you still have women living in refugee camps in places in, in uh, Kurdish occupied places in uh, Iraq and other uh, uh, neighboring states. And uh, you have in equal numbers, on the one hand, women who are still mobilized and support the cause and want their children to take up that fight. Uh, but you also have women who, who, who want, who have been targeted. Uh, they identify as victims who were taken against their will and they are looking for rehabilitation, but they face extreme ostracization from society, from even their own families. And placed in refugee camps, they are extremely vulnerable to not just state authorities, but to any, any, any local power, any, uh, self-appointed uh, uh, um, local leader, you know, who, who is uh, prominent. So uh, the international uh, 
discourse is actually taking away the focus from a lot of these problems and and that is and and normalizing them that you know we're used to this we have been used to the plight of palestinian women for many decades now so nobody talks about it anymore except when you have to make that uh, uh, uh you know that that statement about human rights or whatever once once in a blue moon so uh, it is very difficult to keep up hope but i think uh, what we can keep doing is keep making noise and keep being different Difficult, at least, at the very least, um, I'll stop there uh, and and continue in a bit. Yeah, the situation is very grim, and uh, Ab Mr. Abhinav Pandey is here. Uh, he has joined us today, so welcome, Abhinav. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I'd like to. Today, uh, I have a question. I mean, I, it's not addressed to any specific uh, speakers, but it's a general question. Anyone who wants to take it up, uh, ma'am, uh, I have mostly researched in Kashmir, and there I have come across a very unique phenomenon, especially due to the conflict. Like whenever the there is an encounter site, the militants uh, before the encounter they make a call to their parents and they talk to their mothers and they always say, uh, initially the mothers like they are very sad they say would say that no no why did you join militancy but immediately after a moment you know they would say well you know i mean you're doing a great job in the uh, you know this path to jannat and uh, uh, my uh, best wishes to you and you have really made uh, me and society proud made our religion proud okay? so that's one case where the mothers inspire their sons and, and kids to join the jihad even in the funeral processions, we see that the mothers, uh, uh, they are very proud of their sons, you know, like why, I mean, they joined militancy and they died. So in the in the funeral processions, mothers, they sometimes they lead the processions. So that actually uh, uh, facilitates more uh, recruitment. Besides that, we I also saw that uh, there is this huge drugs problem among the females, you know, also on the one hand, they would be uh, joining the stone pelting protests with everything Islamic and all, but on the other hand, you see a massive drug problem. So do you, I mean, is it something very unique to Kashmir or like in Afghanistan also, uh, you come across such situations? Hello? Anyone of you who would like to answer this question? I mean, I do you come across this in Afghanistan? Uh, yes, um, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, the, uh, uh, most often uh, it's uh, vulnerable refugees who fall prey to, uh, uh, you know, uh, jihad or, you know, uh, uh, jihadi leaders, uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, uh, during the jihad, of course, during the anti-Soviet jihad, uh, we did we we did see sort of a national mobilization against the atheistic communist regime in Afghanistan. But it wasn't really so much be, uh, when I say uh, a national mobilization. What I mean that even secular uh, segments of society, um, you know, through their support behind uh, the jihadis. Back then, of course, nobody had an idea that the jihadis would take power in Afghanistan and establish a very uh, super conservative uh, uh, regime. Uh, but uh, after the uh, communist regime fell apart and, you know, the mujahideen failed to uh, establish order in Afghanistan, most of the recruits of the Taliban really are just vulnerable refugees who are easily susceptible to being recruited. Uh, you know, by these uh, is Islamist militants. So the pa so the trend that you describe is really not a, a pattern uh, that uh, any sort of research has been able to back up. Typically, the classic case in Afghanistan of people being recruited to participate in jihad has been that they come from vulnerable communities where there's no state protection, uh, where they really have no other choice. Uh, but to uh, join uh, Islamist insurgent jihadis. Thank you. Thank I you. see uh, Dr. Priyanka raised her hand. Yeah. Uh, yes, I also wanted to add to this. I think in the case of Kashmir itself, first of all, we need to be very, uh, we need to be wary and discerning of the images that are floating around and, and that we are seeing. It's important to differentiate between a reality and propaganda. So that that is one thing. But I will say this. Uh, um, 
first of all, there's a problem when we think of women as only mothers and we expect them to play only that part as mothers. They, women are also political beings. Women are also citizens who can be very disgruntled with the state, uh, uh, very discontented with the state. And, and that was precisely what I was saying. When states turn rogue or they target part, part of their own population, what recourse do citizens have? So that is very much a question to women. So I don't think, first of all, I don't think that this is a trend even in Kashmir. There may have been instances of this, but this is not the case. Uh, there are certainly, I mean, uh, there would certainly be women and there would be families which are, are very convinced about a violent jihadi cause and, and would celebrate that. Uh, you also see that in the history of, of people uh, 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 like uh, bin Laden, like uh, uh, Al-Fatah, who was, you know, a part of the 9-11 hijackings and so on. And, and when you read their uh, writings and how they were talking about their cause, it is, it is uh, you, you can see that conviction, you know, which is there. So it's certainly there, but I don't think that it is a trend uh, at all. In fact, this kind of image again becomes problematic because we tend to treat all of the very different and often very divergent voices emerging from political Islam to be just that, you know, and, and, and that is actually quite misleading. So uh, I just wanted to add that actually that's not the case. In, and recently, I might just add here for anyone who's interested, there has been, I mean, over the long history since the late 80s and 90s, there is a lot of work, but you also see a lot of uh, uh, writing, a lot of uh, um, semi-fictional writing and, and uh, memoirs and biographies right now, which actually describe in detail the lives of people who are in these conflict situations, uh, Muslim families and women in particular, uh, and what their attitudes are to, the, uh, to this conflict. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to highlight is, of course, whatever one's political standpoint or ideology, uh, we have to also see the kind of compulsions that they are responding to. A lot of the times, uh, I mean, yes, there is a certain brainwashing that happens and there is a certain conviction in a particular cause, but equally it is the, the discontent with uh, one's own situation, you know, economically in terms of access to the most basic facilities. So when we say that, you know, it is perhaps people who are very marginalized who can sometimes buy into this kind of uh, rhetoric. Uh, they're marginalized in every way as citizens, you know, because they don't find that support from the state. And that is where they look for an alternative of sorts. I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, uh, I, I have a few observations, you know, I, I, I think I would like to disagree with you on this. You know, I have been in Kashmir on the ground for the last five years, you know, and I have, you know, listened to, like, heard almost, I would say, more than two to three hundred intercepts you know, of the militants, uh, their communication with their mothers right before the, uh, right before they are killed in the encounters. And those uh, intercepts, those communications, they have a very, very, like, oh, overtly religious tone. You know? And you can actually feel, the, feel that the radicalization, the cause was, you know, I was like primarily religious. Okay. And uh, I can you know, put it on record that jamaat e islami I have worked on that, you know, that's an organization. 60 to 70 percent of recruits in Kashmiri militant groups, they are from jamaat e islami And there is a segment of secular rational students, young students who are studying in Kashmir University. They would complain that they are marginalized. These things hardly get reported in the mainstream media because they, they say that the media, mainstream media in Kashmir, as well as international media, they are biased in the favor of the Islamists and separatists. And uh, one more thing uh, regarding this, uh, the economic part. Uh, I mean, it's on record that over the last uh, 10 years, 16% uh, of funds, uh, the, the national development funds have gone to Kashmir, which constitutes 1% of the population of the country. So poverty is as such not a problem. Poverty is not, not a problem. If you go to Kashmir, the living standards are pretty high. The problem is alienation. I agree that bureaucracy has been a major uh, disadvantage in Kashmir. They have not been uh, behaving properly with the people. And the mainstream politicians, which includes the local politicians, they have been sabotaging the government schemes and uh, all those things. But certainly, the religious radicalizations, that is a very, very serious constituent. If you listen to Burhan Wani's video, which I guess they have deleted now, okay, it was on YouTube, and he straight away talks of caliphate. If you listen to Zakir Musa, he was a celebrity militant who was killed in 2019. 
he is talking about caliphate and he says that I will slit the throats of the Hurriyat members, which are the, who are the separatist party. Uh, it's an Islamist separatist party. And they said that we'll, we'll slit your throats because you want to uh, integrate Kashmir with Pakistan and our aim is to make Kashmir an Islamic caliphate. And, you know, this Zakir Musa is not an ordinary fellow. If you go to Kashmir on the ground, he was a massive celebrity, more than Burhan Bani. Every seven to eight year old children, they would adore him, they would worship him like a hero. So this is a major problem. Uh, coupled with that, drug addiction is also a major problem, even among the females. But yes, I certainly we need more research, more investigation on that. Uh, thank you so much. Would you like to respond? Uh, yes, if I just, if I may just uh, point out yeah. one uh, or two things. So what I was saying was, of course, I'm not saying that there is no radicalization that is there. Uh, uh, and, and it is there and apart from or beyond the radicalization, there is growing discontentment because you are talking about a population which has been living in uh, army jurisdiction for a very long time. So in that sense, Kashmir has been a protected conflict and that has been the experience of the local population. The reason I was mentioning a lot of recent writings on Kashmir is because they bring to the fore uh, details of personal life, you know, day to day life, uh, the simple acts of uh, 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 going to school, looking for a job, what what uh, uh, venues do you have? So there is a discontent because of that. And even that doesn't necessarily always lead to radicalization, but yes, radicalization certainly is there. I cannot comment on uh, uh, drug abuse and I, um, I'm wary of any research which you know goes with this agenda of finding gendered patterns of drug abuse or any such thing. Uh, statistics, you can use statistics to make a point either way. You know that that is one thing that we must be wary of. Uh, so I will not talk about that. But for radicalization, this is what I was saying. Um, it exists. It is certainly there. But I will uh, 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 still highlight the kind of political realities with which, uh, uh, you know, Kashmiri people are living. Uh, there are many, many uh, bits of research, uh, people who've lived there for a long time and people who've gone there with an interest in looking at what role um, religious ideologies play in the day-to-day -day lives of people, not just those who are radicalized, but the larger population. And what they found is that the day-to-day -day, uh, challenges are very much about dealing with curfews when they can open their local shops and businesses and so on and so forth, you know. So uh, uh, I'm not saying that the radicalization is not there, but are the bigger challenges with it, which have, you know, been present for decades now. Uh, talking about the politicians as a whole other discussion that I'm not going to go into, uh, what role they've played and, you know, uh, how they've aggravated. Uh, I think I'm in agreement that there has been an aggravation of the uh, 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 problems, but uh, uh, that's a separate thing. But this is just what I was saying. We are talking about a very peculiar uh, political situation in which people have been living. So to 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 um, you know, uh, talk about uh, normal citizenship standards, whatever that is, is is a little difficult in these particular contexts. I agree, Thank and you so much. Thank you. I also think that we must refrain from such generalization, especially at such critical junctures that uh, West Asia and South Asia is facing at now. And we must also not forget that narratives are set by the dominant forces where marginalized communities, whether it's women, uh, they don't set the narrative. They are the victims on the other hand. And uh, reasons for the discontentment of the people lies deep. Uh, just like in the context of uh, religious extremism, uh, we see people divided on the conceptualization of uh, feminism. So my question is, I mean, people say that uh, they generally resent the imposition of Western feminism. So uh, if we talk about the cultural contextualization of feminism, uh, how far can we take in this, uh, the cultural contextualization of the very conception of feminism? And doing so, uh, don't we risk losing the basic framework and the idea behind feminism and the rights that women acquired through a very long struggle? To some, stretching this beyond a limit uh, may feel like taking a step back instead of moving forward, especially when there's a, when we still have a very long way to go. So, uh, my question was to you, Dr. Priyanka, but any one of you can respond, respond to it. 
Okay, I'll just uh, um, I'll answer, but I'm very very keen to hear what my co-panelists have to say also. Uh, so, uh, with regard to Western feminism and the imposition of it, first of all, I would contend that uh, you know not everybody is anti uh, antagonistic to Western feminism. Uh, like I was saying. Uh, regardless of whether there is an oriental gaze uh, there are certain aspects of uh, western liberalism at large which are appealing to a lot of uh, 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 people you have very uh, and and a lot of the secular voices in particular they are very very critical of of uh, uh, whenever they see an islamist regime come to power sorry to interrupt uh, uh, yes. can we say that at this particular time of period that we are sorry can we say that with the such conviction, especially at this point of time, whether we are talking about Afghanistan or India? Uh, I, so I didn't follow the question. Can we say what? Uh, can we say that most of the people are in the favor of Western uh, feminism or no, liberalism? No, 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 no. No, I would not say that. So uh, I, no. again, these are generalizations to say most people are one way or the other. Yeah. I was just saying that uh, there are both religious and secular forces. And there are also secular forces, secular ideas, which are not uh, necessarily very impressed with Western and, and classical liberal feminism. So feminisms are, of course, a spectrum and there are different schools within them. Uh, so, you know, Western liberal feminism is already quite outdated, quite uh, widely criticized uh, and so on. Uh, but you have a lot of secular voices uh, that are very critical of religious uh, uh, regimes, at least when I speak about West Asia. You have very celebrated feminists like Mona al Dahavi, for instance, who's very opposed to the idea of a Muslim uh, or Islamist uh, regime coming to power in countries like Egypt. A very staunch opposition to uh, the rule of Mohammed Morsi when he was briefly elected to power for this reason. So uh, that is certainly there. But on the other hand, something that you see which is very interesting, and I've written about this also, is uh, the fact that uh, while they may be coming from different vantage points, and, and there are deep contestations be between religious and secular feminisms, uh, some of the issues are the same, you know. Uh, uh, and, and actually, you, you, while there is deep contestation, you also see convergence on many of the issues. So uh, one thing which emerged post the Arab uprisings in countries like Egypt was this call for greater political participation and representation of women in countries like Egypt. And that was a call that was being made uh, by both religious and secular forces. There's also a, a, a Muslim sister wing of the Muslim Brotherhood, right? And the younger generation in particular, they were pushing for this from within a, a, a perspective of a, a political Islam. So, uh, and, and in those ways, these, these causes sometimes find an overlap of sorts. So, you know, it is it is a little more complicated and it's, it's a little um, misleading to draw these binaries of saying either or, it's not always like that. Uh, and I just wanted to highlight these complexities because then there is no straight answer. You know, sometimes they will align on questions of education, on questions of, uh, 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 you know, human rights. And on other issues, of course, a lot of secular feminists will see that the coming of any Islamist regime to power or any religious regime to power is going to be uh, uh, dangerous to these particular ideals. But a lot of the causes can be the same. So, uh, you know, I, I'm I, the point I'm making is just that it is not very clear cut binaries. Uh, uh, the deeper we go into these nuances, the messier uh, these issues are actually. So it's very, very uh, dangerous to make any generalizations. Yeah, OK, I agree. And before I open to the audience, uh, I have one last question. And uh, this is to you, Dr. Shirali, at first. And uh, since uh, Ms. Meena Nizami has left, my question is, uh, looking around, can we say that the intersection and intermingling of religion and politics poses an obstacle in dealing with violence against women? And what's the way forward? So obviously, in the context of Afghanistan, um, uh, I would have to say that uh, the answer is yes, emphatically, because in the 1960s, when the Is Afghan Islamists first emerged, they were a very marginalized group. Now, of course, the 1960s was a very different time where leftism and secularism was in vogue in the developing world. Um, 
so, but um, when I when you say religion and politics, uh, the mixing of religion and politics, uh, I'm talking specifically about the Afghan context, and I think it's important here because sometimes you know there are blanket statements made that you know political Islam or Islamism, political Islam is different in different countries. Uh, political Islam in Afghanistan is very different uh, from Egypt uh, or, or Lebanon uh, or, or, or Turkey. Um, so in Afghanistan, Isla Islamists uh, were originally a very, very marginalized group who did not re uh, represent mainstream values. And, who, and the only reason they were elevated was when they received U.S. backing as the resistance force during the Cold War against Soviet occupation. And I want to make it emphatically clear that there was no grass, I mean, other than people uh, supporting uh, the Mujahideen, it was only because they were against Soviet, the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. There really wasn't this kind of homegrown grassroots internal, uh, genuine internal support for them. It, they were really uplifted and elevated by the Cold War uh, uh, geopolitics. And ironically, U.S. support during uh, the jihad of the night, the so anti-Soviet jihad. So absolutely, it has been abused, uh, uh, misused, uh, and imposed on, a, on the Afghan population, who up until the fall of the old regime, at least at the state level, Afghanistan was a secularizing country. If you take a look at the 1964 Afghan constitution, it was a secular constitution, and it passed without much uproar. So the transformation of Afghan society by Islamists really has nothing to do with any internal Afghan political dynamics. It's really been a, a result of global geopolitics. Uh, and unfortunately, today, most people know of Afghanistan as a place where women's rights are alien to its culture, Unfortunately, you know, even though research, you know, extensive research has been done that uh, religion, culture, any type of fixed social attributes really have no bearing on how women have historically been treated in Afghanistan. What matters in Afghanistan is situational politics. We've had secular regimes. We've had, you know, uh, moderately secular regimes. And uh, Islamism is really something that uh, has been externally imported to Afghanistan because the Islamists were sponsored by, uh, you know, initially when they emerged, they had backing from Saudi Arabia, Pakistan. And then, of course, they were they were elevated by the dynamics of the Cold War and uh, global geopolitics. Yeah, that's a very important point you mentioned that we have to take note of the situation at different periods of time. Uh, Dr. Priyanka, would you like to add to it? Uh, no, no, I completely agree. Uh, and I think it's, uh, I mean, when you say political Islam, I'm treating it as this umbrella term where there are many different and, like I said, very divergent ideologies that emerge from within. So Islamic feminists are also within that umbrella. But then you have, uh, you know, the radicalized and, and violent extremists who are also one extreme of that. Uh, so, so political Islam is different, not just across different countries, but also within countries, actually. And there's a big fight a lot of the times, a, a big debate on, on on what values or what ideals will be upheld in the name of religion, which is why it is very difficult to make any such generalizations. So I, I completely agree about that. And uh, 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 this also ties into what I was saying earlier, because a lot of the conflict situations where you see uh, the rise of violent extremism, uh, you see that it has uh, uh, either responded to global international geopolitical developments and compulsions or actually in many cases been aided by it you know as has been seen in afghanistan uh, as has been seen in multiple cases uh, so uh, uh, you know uh, one shouldn't mistake that for the entirety of political islam and uh, a lot of people who will talk about um, having a very organic idea of the self which may be in, in uh, uh, informed by religion will still be very opposed to some of these organizations and their activities uh, so the point is precisely that when you impose something top down it is inherently oppressive so whether it is a secular brand of politics or a religious brand of politics right uh, uh, there has to be a way 
to think about it organically from within uh you know which is why revolutions i mean it's called a revolution and then it's uh, uh being dismissed also but arab spring uprisings or other such events become important in that context but certainly i mean we cannot make any generalizations about um the nature of or 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 uh, be very sure of what the nature of a religious regime is going to be when it is in power uh it, it's the specific set of values that they're imposing that will determine outcomes thank you uh and as we see miss meena nizami has also joined so i would now open the floor to the audience question and uh, i see fatima has raised her hand would you come forward oh, and hey everyone and hello good afternoon and just one minute and others may put their questions in the chat box or if you want you can raise your hand yes fatima go ahead yeah good afternoon hey everyone thank you for uh, organizing such beautiful and uh, fruitful session which is uh, related to women and i want to introduce myself i am fatima kamandi nasir i am residing in spain right now and hi i'm an afghan uh, female activist mm -hmm. and uh, right now i am uh, uh, part of an organization which is called arya a i am uh, vice president of this organization and i want to add something about uh, afghanistan only because uh, uh, talking about politics issues and uh, religion is really complicated and we can't uh, talk about each and every part of the world separately and it's it's a big issue for everyone but let's talk about my my own country you know uh, uh it has been a decade or uh, oh, maybe two decades that uh, we people or more than that the three people uh, live in conflict based area and of course it 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 uh, affected it has affected like uh, for for women for uh, social life everything it matters and of course which we see in afghanistan politics and religion as como uh, like uh, it has it had been like uh, going on hand in hand people know right now the world know how to use politics they use politics by the name of religion they know how to target women how to target men how to target global citizen and of course during decade we women are come like um, we we are victims victims of these conflicts civil wars then right now it is it is conflict that is going on in afghanistan if we think that it's okay that uh, government has changed taliban are governing the country but what happens it is it is like uh, we are right now uh, having a conflict between a government and uh, and the citizens of afghanistan they are not happy they are having like a uh, conflict uh, Uh, a civil conf uh, civil conflict uh, is going on in afghanistan right now for example if we see the issue of panjshir people are suffering from conflict especially women taliban are targeting the women of panjshir it is a province of afghanistan we can't we can't forget women as pain and right now they are victims of this conflict because of religion because of politics thank you so much thank you fatima and we all here understand and uh, we share the pain that women have to face and no one is denying that thank you fatima for your comments and the next question is from shweta to dr jalali uh, how do you see the afghan culture getting completely washed out after the taliban take over Thank you for your uh question. So, uh I personally feel that I am view I am watching uh Afghan a uh, culture uh, Afghanistan being erased in real time. We have seen the destruction of historical landmarks. 
We have seen the imposition of a type of dress on women that has never existed in Afghanistan before. Uh, we are seeing the demolition of historical sites uh, for the purpose of uh, building madrasas, religious schools on those same very sites. So this is something that I have really been, uh, uh, you know, literally screaming about ever since August of 2021, uh, because it's one thing uh, to, uh, you know, impose restrictions on women, but cultural heritage, it's, it's not just Afghan women facing restrictions uh, on their fundamental human rights. It's also literally the cultural genocide of Afghanistan. And I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm really not exaggerating here. Uh, we are literally seeing this happen, uh, which is extremely alarming. And what's, uh, what's, uh, you know, uh, like I, I put on, a, I put on my Afghan dress and, you know, it went global and, and, and I'm happy about that. But that's literally, I mean, we are facing an existential threat to our identity, our history, our cultural heritage. Now I've, I've said this before, um, the cultural heritage of each country is also part of world heritage. And unfortunately, we are living in a time where global discourse has shifted and these issues are not of any importance. Just this morning, uh, I read a headline in the Guardian newspaper calling the Taliban Afghan clerics, which, you know, is really shocking because after 20 years, this is the knowledge base of international journalists. We all know that the Taliban are not an Afghan movement. Um, you know, there's been a lot of research done that they first appear in Pakistan and not in Kandahar. So I am gravely, gravely concerned uh, about uh, the loss of our cultural heritage. And every day there's another violation of that. Either one, you know, there was the famous uh, Bamiyan, uh, the Buddhist statues of Bamiyan in the 1990s, which was called a crime against humanity in the 1990s. But today nobody makes any noise about what the Taliban are doing. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it's very alarming. I mean, I'm very fearful of in the next 10 decades, how much t damage will the Taliban do? Is Afghanistan even going to be recognizable to Afghans um, in the, you know, in, in the not too distant future? Ms. Mean, uh, Nizami, would you like to add to it? I think she can't hear us. Uh, any other question from audience? Uh, yes, Pavna, you can go ahead. So, uh, since we have been discussing uh, on you know lives, especially human lives uh, in conflict, so as uh, um, I might not not have researched as much as uh, of course everyone. But I worked extensively for, uh, you know, uh, women education disparity, especially in higher education in India. And I plan to pursue conflict studies in the future. So I just want to know that we talk about status of women, especially in the uh, conflict zone. And we have been discussing Afghanistan and, uh, you know, uh, many other countries. But when we talk about Africa, like there are there are countries like Ethiopia, so I have met men from Afghanistan, from Ethiopia, we have studied together. And uh, so there are countries which are completely run by women force. It has seen uh, maybe a civil war, or there has been maybe uh, some conflict between the region. So when we talk about this phase of women, like post conflict, maybe women has evolved the first evolved and maybe got a political or economically a better stature. In certain areas, what what is the reason that it is not highlighted as much as we are talking about the down? I I totally agree that women have suffered and worked on prostitution also. So I know that I was about. But then my my question is also what what space which has happened she must also be highlighted. So what is your point of view on on that one, where women has evolved not only politically economically. But also at a general or societal level, she she has evolved in multiple areas. This can happen. So what is your thought? 
Uh, I would request any of the panel members to answer the question, and I request audience to put your question in the chat box since the voice is not very clearly audible, so it becomes difficult to listen to it. Keep your questions uh, a bit short. So any one of you who can want to respond to that. Okay, should I go first? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so I, as part of my work, I also look at North Africa countries that identify themselves as, as Arab and uh, have significant, uh, and in most cases, majority Muslim populations, but also other uh, uh, populations, like there's a minority of Berbers uh, uh, in Tunisia and part of Ethiopia and so on. So, um, uh, I, I think there are multiple things here uh, from what I could hear. Uh, I couldn't hear the entire question, but I'm kind of piecing it together. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, I, I find it a little um, counterproductive to, to uh, you know, uh, take one small victory in, in a long string of struggles and say that, you know, women are evolving on that. We, we, we are bound to do that. OK, uh, we are meant to do that. We are going forward and we don't ask for any special treatment in that. The point is to look at what all creates a hindrance to these these uh, efforts of women uh, to better their lives and the lives of their sisters and the subsequent generations. Of course, we as feminists are standing on the shoulders of many, many feminists before us. Right. Uh, sadly, it seems now that we are we are. Uh, in a regressive phase, which is very concerning with things like a ban on abortions in the US and many such things. But uh, regardless, these are things that we should think about. Uh, I'll say just a couple of things. The first thing is, of course, some uh, in, in some instances, the impact of first I take the longer history of colonialism and uh, the kind of political developments in some of these countries in Tunisia, in in uh, uh, Morocco, in uh, you know, uh, in Libya. All of these countries, ha and in Algeria, of course, where colonialism lasted for for a long time. Uh, so there has been that colonial trauma and the very stunted economic development and the newer issues of. Uh, um, human trafficking, sex trafficking in particular, uh, and so on, which have been there. And there have been efforts, consistent efforts, uh, from what I understand, you know, from the UN to, to other uh, uh, humanitarian organizations, which have been striving to work towards these and, and, and address these. I feel that uh, the general sense is that there are things, uh, uh, that things have improved somewhat, but it's a very limited improvement. And the other thing which is interesting is uh, just to highlight and give you a sense of what's happening and why I keep talking about a, a, a host of compulsions to which women as political beings are responding, not just one particular issue of uh, human trafficking or the, the colonial history or whatever. Um, I was reading a case study from Morocco by somebody called Katia Elliott, and uh, it, it's worth looking at it. Um, because she was looking at uh, uh, the kind of choices that young women are making in in countries like Morocco and looking at uh, you know the, the the ideas of development women empowerment and so on the question of rights and and one thing that she uh, finds is that a lot of young women who now have access to higher education are actually opting not to go for it right and now this is interesting uh, you see, because uh, while there is a mechanism to perhaps provide it and provide at least a limited degree of economic mobility to people, there are women who are not opting for it because they feel the price will be too high to pay in terms of social marginalization that happens, right? Uh, so the whole development rhetoric also needs to be thoroughly uh, examined because when we say we'll put malls or we'll have these international offices and you can work, um, uh, there is limited economic uh, 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 mobility that is perhaps achieved, but it also comes with these kinds of costs, right? Um, so, uh, and of course, this is a very small uh, example that I'm giving. I'm not saying this represents all of what is happening in North Africa, uh, but these are the kind of challenges that uh, uh, that people are responding to. Um, and uh, with regard to uh, 
you know, sexual violence, etc. These have also been countries where sexual violence has actually been very, very rampant. Uh, even countries like Egypt, which is also sometimes considered part of North Africa and partly part of West Asia, uh, has had a very bad track record of, of sexual violence against women. And I almost feel guilty saying this as somebody who's sitting in Delhi because our own record is not great. Uh, so, you know, we have these internal challenges. It, the interesting thing for me to see, and if... Um, Bhavna, uh, if I'm correct, is going to look at conflict studies. I would be very keen to know, uh, and, and maybe you can look at this, how uh, the present political situations help or actually compound some of these problems of conflict, of sexual violence, of social uh, marginalization, and so on. So uh, I guess in this case, I'm leaving the question to you, and maybe you can, through your uh, exploration, answer it. Thank you. Thank you for the question and thank you for your response. Uh, next question is from Shweta again, and uh, this is to Dr. Priyanka. Uh, what do you think of ISIS war brides and their situation in the Middle East since as the case of Shamima Begum as she was denied UK citizenship while she wanted to return home? Uh, Ma'am, you are on mute. Sorry. Um, so, um, this is something that I was actually alluding to earlier when I was talking about ISIS wives uh, who are still there in refugee camps, and there's a big crisis now. Uh, again, the question is how are we? How does one think about rehabilitating them? And you know, as we were saying, with a new headline and a new news and a new conflict every day, how much of the attention of the international community is still going to those places. Uh, uh, it seems uh, right now that it's largely the Kurdish population and, and uh, you know, where they are in control of territories in uh, or have limited control in territories in Iraq, that they are the ones who are managing uh, uh, the situation. But the conditions in these refugee camps are, of course, dire. And uh, there is a big uh, challenge because it is reflected both in state policies with denial of visas etc and also as i was saying the kind of social ostracization many of the families of many of these women uh, do not want them to return uh, a lot of them have children now and so you know they have no recourse to any kind of rehabilitation socially uh, and and also in other ways i mean uh, do we realistically can we realistically see uh, for instance employment opportunities for them right how are you um, no. I request you to mute. Just, just, just okay. Oh. Am I not on the mute? Yeah, you, you can mute me from your side. Uh, Preeti, can you mute him? Yeah, I'm just doing it. Just give me a minute. It's done. Okay, uh, now that would be all for today. We can't take up any more questions. And uh, thank you. Thank you, panelists, for patiently listening to us. Thank you, our guests and the audience. And uh, that would be all for today. And to sum up, uh, I would say women face violence and discrimination all the time, and it's not restricted to one place or region, but the conflicts exacerbate those hardships. The perpetrators of crimes and violence against women, as we discussed, include civilians, displaced citizens, militia, and even military officers, and that's because of unequal power dynamics in the society. And it doesn't matter much to have a statistical analysis later. Ultimately, the suffering of women doesn't seem to end. It also leads to several other problems like uh, psychological trauma, childbirth resulting from sexual violence. This also reverberates in post-conflict June because of the breakdown of rule of law, institutional collapse, ensuing frustration in the society, and the most importantly, the normalization of gender violence. Uh, I hope some of the thoughts that we share today, that we are experts here today, uh, give a direction to move forward to a better future for women. Thank you all from the Usinus Foundation team and the GPI team. I pass the floor to the founder and CEO of Usinus Foundation, Mr. Abhinav Pandya. Over to you, Abhinav.
Thank you. Abhinav, can you listen? Abhinav, can you hear? Hello, yeah. Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yes, yes. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, all the speakers for this uh, very enlightening discussion today, uh, Dr. Jalali, Dr. Priyanka Chandra, and uh, Meena Nazami. Thank you so much for joining us today. I mean, although this is not my area of expertise, but certainly, I mean, it matters to all of us, and it's very, very relevant today. Uh, and uh, we learned a lot through a very cross-disciplinary and diverse uh, uh, views on this subject of um, feminine, uh, uh, female issues in the conflict areas. And the most interesting part for me was this, you know, the diversity in the political Islam and uh, uh, this, you know, the, its uh, connection with the uh, female issues in the conflict area mostly. Uh, I mean, I would like to go back to Dr. Jalali's uh, you know, mention of uh, how society and the mainstream values in Afghanistan were. So while I was at Cornell, I had a very good friend from Afghanistan, Rafi Shehzad. And he used to mention about this uh, Pashtun Valley Code, uh, which was a uh, very different from like, you know, what the kind of, you know, the radical narratives which we hear about Afghanistan, the society was very different. He introduced me to Ahmad Zahid's songs and, you know, and uh, I still continue to listen to Ahmad Zahid's songs, you know, and uh, let me tell you, many of those songs, even the Persian ones, they have the same music uh, which many Bollywood songs have. And uh, Mohammad Rafi sang those songs in India, and Ahmad Zahir sang those songs in Persia. But beautiful, I mean, you know, the music is same, and uh, the fusion was so amazing. I mean, it's really amazing for us. Then he introduced me to Ustad Nashinas, you know, who sang that famous song of Kale Segal. You know? so, so that was my introduction to Afghanistan. But uh, yeah, certainly besides that. Uh, Thank you once again, and uh, we would like to engage you more often in the future, and we'll have uh, more events on the female issues, and we'll have uh, something on the Kashmir, then I'll invite you, both of you, uh, and all of you, in fact, okay, for uh, putting a different perspective. Thank you once again. Thanks, Smriti, for this amazing moderation, and thank you, Preeti, Mihir, and uh, Chweta uh, for the great job. Okay. Thank you so much, and I would like to thank all the audience also. Thank you.